Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast. And on today's episode, uh, I'm excited to be covering an amazing topic of building remote sales systems. Today's influencer guest is Jeff Butler, the founder of Jay Butler International. And Jeff was originally based and grew up out of my favorite city in San Francisco, California. Although now he's taken a west to east coast trip and is based out of Boston, uh, Massachusetts. So a great big welcome to the show, Jeff. How are you today? Oh, Mike, I'm, I'm doing awesome. How are you? I'm absolutely fantastic. So tell us a little bit about the trip from west to east and uh, what brought that about? Yeah. So most people think, <laughs> oh, why would you make such a big change? Because I grew up in Silicon Valley, been there my entire life, went to college there, went to high school there. And it was bizarre because my grandfather has a whole bunch of real estate. That's how he earned his living. And yeah. he just got a place out in uh, just south of Boston called Cohasset. And he's centralized in Las Vegas, which has zero, in, uh, zero taxes, right? For state taxes. And he doesn't want to move out to Massachusetts. So he has to be here at least less than half of all the days of the year. And he asked me, hey, can you watch the place while I'm gone? <laughs> and I said, well, do I have to pay rent? And he's like, no. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. And it's kind of weird because I, I moved and I'm still like, I'm late 20s. And the house is big enough, so I don't really feel like it's bigger than my apartment, obviously, that I had in Berkeley. But it's it's very interesting because there's one, like the whole move and everything. But it's also, I spent about probably six hours talking to my grandfather my entire life. Wow. And then having the actual experience of moving out there and then having a tight relationship with him, I found out I had more in common with him than my own father, wow. which was really really weird yeah. on there and i yeah because it's like he almost died several times and so it's like i kind of felt like really lucked out that i actually got to meet him there and really develop a relationship and kind of understand how where my roots come from if that makes sense yeah and you know it's funny isn't it how sometimes you can just sort of not fall into those relationships but those relationships can develop later on in life and you know you you know sometimes you look back over your shoulder and think hey why didn't i do that earlier or something like that and like you say more in common than Wow, that's a, that's a strong statement. But, you know, you, you must be so pleased that that's on, on, on a level playing field now. And, you, you know, you're speaking, you know, you're doing business together and, you, you know, you're helping him out on the East Coast. So, yeah, that's an amazing uh, sort of transformation. Yeah, kind of weird. I mean, most people are like, I want to try something different. It, wasn't, <laughs> it was like, oh, cool. It can, work, it can work well for, like, I don't have to pay rent because of my business. But then it turned out to be something completely different, which yeah. is awesome. Amazing. Well, like I say, today we're going to be speaking all about building remote sales systems. And we're going to dip in and out of millennials, uh, millennials as well, which is Jeff sure. is, uh, you know, a, a trusted uh, global keynote uh, expert around as well. And, you know, uh, for those regular people who listen to our show, we're very appreciative of the time. And, you know, I always sort of give my little sort of intro to the show. Um, you know, for many organizations where, the, uh, you know, maybe initial sales revenues have, you know, come from the owner driver, the, you know, the founder, the bootstrap starter um, you know you may not have a, a budget yet to go out and hire a full team and sometimes getting involved with a sales contract and maybe the best option uh, whether you are hiring internally looking externally there's a wide range of options out there um, you know and ultimately in this podcast what we're going to be covering with Jeff is the key areas that are essential to help you you know on your journey whether that's sales outsourcing sales systems you know just having a look at that as a as a whole because you know without revenue Jeff as we know we ain't got any business and exactly you know, dedicated resource to get that for those who are interested you can check uh, out jeff online uh, what i would first uh, recommend that you do is head over to the website at jeffjbutler.com that is j-e-f-f -F, and then the letter j uh, butler b-u-t-l-e-r.com you can find out uh, jeff you know, on all the major social platforms, including LinkedIn, uh, at Twitter, at Jamie, uh, sorry, Jeff, sorry, I do, do apologize, at I am Jeff Butler. Uh, that's a bit of a tongue tie, and I wasn't expecting that one. No, I just reel them out. Uh, Facebook is uh, I am Jeff Butler, um, and again, Instagram handle I am Jeff Butler. So mm -hmm. that's the one for you listening on the app. I'll get these links posted in the show notes and on the um, under the video here today. So before we kick off and get involved, let's just learn a little bit about because your backstory is pretty amazing for I suppose most and it would be a dream looking from the outside in <laughs> really <laughs> yeah, a lot of people will say wow you know I wish that was me growing up as a kid 
But yeah. in the 90s, Jeff grew up in Silicon Valley, um, you know, uh, in a household where both his parents built and sold software businesses. Um, and tell us a little bit more about that, uh, you know, that upbringing in the 90s, Jeff. Obviously, Silicon Valley, we all understand, you know, what it is today. Love to get your view of what it was as a kid growing up in the 90s. Um, you know, and, you know, ultimately, uh, what that experience was and how does that serve you in later life? Yeah, the experience is really interesting. I mean, that's the only area I grew up in, right? So I don't have anything to compare it to. A mom and dad both worked. Um, they So every single day after high school, what I would do is if I didn't have a sport or some club, I would take a bus over to their office. And their office was, was about two miles away from my high school. And there's about 10, 15 employees in there. And so I would go into the conference room where they normally have meetings and I'll do homework. And during that time, I got to see my parents manage employees and I'm, you know, super young absorbing all of this and get into that environment where, you know, there's servers over there. My dad might interrupt my homework uh, doing time and says, oh, can you install some different uh, software on this computer over here, like a Windows 2000, right? And I would have to do that during that period of time. And so like, I mean, it, it got pretty hardcore at points where even earlier in my life, before I could play my first video game, my dad had me take apart a computer and tell him, had to, I had to tell him all the different parts to it. Wow. So that was the upbringing of, yeah. But it's weird though, because you would think both were probably like MIT, Harvard, that kind of thing, but it was actually quite different. My mother was very, very intelligent and just really sharp. My dad was more the creative type. And so he struggled to get into college. When my mom like got into all the different universities, she waited for him and they ended up both going to University of Pacific and they both graduated with accounting and marketing. Right. So the reason why I mention this is that most people say, wow, you're in Silicon Valley and you know technology. They went to a, they went to a community college while having kids and rental homes to learn programming languages. So my mom can code and so can my dad. And it was more of, they saw that technology was changing, so they had to stay with it. Right, and that's why they had me kind of pushing it on me when I was younger, but the weird part is, when I went to college, first off, I got in as an athlete. I wasn't, I was training for the Olympics, I didn't care about computer science, and I wanted to do business. And I dropped business for computer science (laughs) at that time, And and I took the class, and I got over 100%, I'm like, oh, I like doing this, and so, uh, being extremely naive, uh, I guess a naive 18 year old. I mean, come on, that's very naive. <laughs> I decided to go into the number two university, like computer science major in yes. all of the United States. Right. So we were second to MIT. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Tied with uh, Stanford. Like it's changes off and on. Yeah. Amazing. And that, yeah. And that's no joke. So that was uh, my introduction to it. You know, when I was in, in the university, I got the fifth lowest score out of 300 people on my first final, just destroyed. But at the end, I was near the top of my class. And the point is, is, you know, you don't start at the top usually in those spaces. My parents did not start there. They just learned some programming languages and then they hired their professor to be a, a software engineer. <laughs> yeah, move up from there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, uh, looking at, again, looking from the outside in, you know, you mentioned there about, you know, graduating at UC Berkeley uh, with a degree in computer science. Um, and then, you know, that sort of got you involved then, didn't it, with some of the Silicon Valley's fastest, char- you know, charging startups. And yeah. tell us a little bit about that, that sort of transformation. You know, you've been in and around the Silicon Valley space growing right. up. As a, as a child, uh, you then sort of graduating out of Berkeley, going into that sort of, you know, um, f- you know, fast moving Silicon Valley startup area. What was the transition like from, you know, Berkeley into what I would call the real practical stuff? Yeah, it started? wasn't. A, yeah, to concisely answer that, it actually was no transition because yeah. a big thing that we had in college was the peer pressure to get internships yeah. and there was this sort of already applied of like, to get in there. yeah so by the time I graduated I had three internships under my belt oh, from different, working at different companies so when I started full-time it wasn't an adjustment from a culture or a work ethic standpoint it was more of an existential adjustment yeah because you go from this utopian reality of hey, you know, there's parties, I get to work out, I get to go to classes. You don't really worry about money that much. It's like, yeah, you have some spending money from internships. But when you hit the workforce, it's a weird adjustment when you realize, look, this is like 
this is it. <laughs> this is how you earn money now. There's no fancy this is real world. party. Yeah, this is yeah, a- it's a really interesting uh, adjustment. I mean, some love it. Most people, I would say, are terrified by it and why, why they go to maybe master's, graduate school yeah, and all that to longer. kind of prolong that experience. Yeah. So tell us some about some of the highs and the lows of that, because whether that's in the internship or that, you know, when you went, you know, the work first, you know, full time. What's yeah. the highs and the lows? Because, you know, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs around the world. Right highly highly successful like yourself too. and none of them uh, have just had a plane you know sail as you know as ryan would say her hoy ship ahead you know there, there, it's none of that the, you know the sinking the boats the, they're underwater you know they're the struggling they get on top they go back they have you know wild successes or and in many cases wild failures as well and i always love to ask what is the biggest failures what is the biggest successes and what lessons learned if you want to call it that from those experiences i'd love you to share a, you know a few of those with us if you could some highs and lows yeah those are really that's a great question i'll i'll touch on that so i guess i'll start off the statement with the first one was more of an existential one where i was probably two weeks into my first full-time job and when you have an internship you know it's going to end so it's not a big deal but it gives you a taste of the workforce but when you have a full time you kind of are thinking well i could be here for years yeah So two weeks into my first full-time job, I was sitting down next to someone who was a lead engineer. I was more of a junior entry-level engineer. And we had about 15 years of difference in age and about 70K worth of salary. So I was earning about 100, he was earning 170. And I thought about that and I said, if I'm doing the same thing here for 15 years, showing up at this desk, I'll be earning what he is. And that terrified me. And now most people would say, wow, that's a lot of money. Not if you live in Silicon Valley and you have to pay like 30%, 35% in taxes. Yeah. When someone hears 100K, they don't realize that your take home from that each month post-tax is like 5,200. Yeah. If you pay rent, right? And say you have a $2,000 apartment, that's 3,200. You have groceries, you have utility bills. Oh, look, there's 2,000 left over. Wow, you're a millionaire. Like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not that. And so earlier on, my main fear was my parents in the 2008 financial crisis had to sell their home had to give up like sports cars because they just actually had uh, one of their companies acquired and move into a much smaller uh, place. And that was a wake up call because we were like living lavishly and then boom, you know, it was eight years living up to that. And then all disappeared in about four months. And I remember that I, regardless of who's in my life, I want to be financially secure. Like no matter what happens, I'm okay. Which drove me to start my first company. Now here's where we go into, there's some pain there, but here's more of the bigger pain. At 23, I started my first tech company. It was no money raised. It was bootstrapped. It was something similar to what my parents were doing in a different industry. That's kind of how I knew of it. And about a year into it, we had a a couple of customers. It was earning some money. And I thought, hey, I'm ready. I have a lot of willpower. Let me go just leave my job. It wasn't enough money to live off of, but I wanted to do it anyway. Yeah. My parents said, no, don't do it. That's not a good idea. You pay, take your income from your day job and put it into your business. But I wanted to be cool and be like, hey, you know, I have, I'm paying for all my own stuff. And I left. Ugh. So I, after leaving, uh, six months in, I realized that I don't even, I don't even want to do this. Like, I don't, I don't care about this, even though like, you know, I have an LLC and all this wonderful stuff. And I ended up exiting. The, I left the company and it's, it was it's still operating today. But I remember having no job, some student loan debt, all the cash that I had saved up from working that full day job and a whole bunch of time. (laughs) And I remember thinking, oh, wow, like, yeah, that wasn't very smart. Like the bank account goes (laughs) boom, 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 boom. (laughs) It just like disappears. And I'm I'm very frugal. Like I'm not going out buying cars or anything or anything crazy like that or taking wild vacations. I'm having like, two pairs of jeans, you know, glasses that are all scratched up, you know, like very minimal and it just starts disappearing. And I remember that uh, I went into speaking during that time. We can go into that later. But the pain point of the story is that I ended up burning every single penny of mine and then going into debt, Uh. trying to start my next company. And I'm probably one of the first entrepreneurs you talk to, or maybe one of a couple that actually had to go back to work in corporate Uh. after leaving. And you can imagine like having to sit across from a recruiter being like, Uh, oh, so I was just on hiatus for a bit. You know, I kind of just need the money because I'm like, you know, I have some debt and just, it wasn't pretty. 
right? And I that was a matter of a year time frame period trying to get something to work. Oh, so being like, hey, I'm super cool, you know, I'm leaving to like, oh, this is what it's like to be broke. Wonderful, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and do you know what? It, it, it's interesting because there's that fear of, oh my God, I've got to go out and get a normal job, you know, as an entrepreneur. Oh, if that switch, that switch flick, say, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, you've covered that, how you did that, but switch yeah. back in. But, you know, I think ultimately, you know, needs must. And, you know, it, I think what the lesson the, that I pick out of that, Jeff, you know, I, I don't know if you agree or you've got a different take on this. Mm. Is that, and for all those listening, you know, uh, on the podcast is, you know, it's not a crime to make a decision that you don't want to make if it's the right you know, reason. Sometimes you've got to drop the ego, you know, and uh, uh, as Ryan and Leonard say, yeah. ditch the act. You've got to say, hey, this is really where I'm at. If I want to get back to where I want to be or was hoping to be by now, then, you know, sometimes you do have to take a step back. You know, it's not about losing. It's not about being defeatist. It's about, you know, making the right decisions. And if you get into that mindset, I mean, I've seen it over 25 years in boardrooms, publicly traded companies, private companies, yep. startups and everything. You know, sometimes people are fearful for making that whatever the decision is, I'm going to hire this employee, you know, fire this employee. I'm going to, you know, you know, my partner who we grew up with, let him go because he's no longer cutting it at the level that we're at. Whatever that is, it doesn't really matter. There is no shame at all in making a decision that actually takes you back as long as it's the right decision because it gives you that mm. ability to sort of refocus in and then rebuild up and go forward with clarity because otherwise it just weighs on your mind. And in your case, Jeff, here, that debt was building up and the ego was wherever it was, you know, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but you know, no, no. hey, 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 you know, but that has to go. You know, the reality is you've got to address the key issues in business. And that's, yeah, exactly right. you'd be amazed on how much egos in Silicon Valley, <laughs> whether it's, hey, let's raise a whole bunch of money or yeah. I want to look like a cool entrepreneur. Yeah. But it can really take a shot at you. And it's not until I think going broke was one of the most empowering things because you realize what I did didn't work. I have to take responsibility for where I am and move forward. Absolutely. There's no excuses. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, for, for, for regular listeners, you may have heard this statement a, a, a few times, but it, this keeps me in check. Back in 2012, Jeff, we, we'd got a $20 million, about 12, 30 million pounds UK finance company here in the publicly traded. Um, and we lost it in administration at the height. You know, we were a finance company at the height when the world went bust, really, you know, in, in the height of the recession. Um, it, and for me, just short of half a million pounds. So again, the dollar rate at the time was, the dollar rate at the time was about $1.70, $1.80. So what is it that? Eight, nine hundred thousand dollars loss. Um, and literally, you you know, I feel ashamed. I feel I've lost. I'm a loser, all that type of stuff. But, you know, ultimately, what does it do? It puts things into perspective. Like you say, you know, we weren't, you know, yeah, you know, the, the, the cars went, you know, we kept us house. That was great. You know what I mean? And things like that. But everything else, we just ditched out. We've got a bit of money. We've got a bit of a property portfolio going. And we've got a little bit there. But actually, we was asset rich, cash mm -hmm. work. And it just literally wiped us sort of out. But what do you do? It, it's that humble sobering thing and for me talking yep. about it whether it's this episode the next one i did three episodes ago it just keeps me zoned dialed into the zone that you know about making the right decisions like you said being frugal you know managing it and, and being aware of the opportunities and it's not all it's not all highs and lows you know there's a balance between the two and, and that's the discipline for me that i never want to go back and be in that situation again so it makes me think better about the decisions yeah, because there's so much social pressure that is kind of telling you, hey, you have to take this path of entrepreneurship. It's cool. It's sexy. I give a lot of talks in corporations and I'm like, look, there's a good reason to work for someone else because the amount of emotional stress is fairly low. I mean, there's a lot of research yeah. that doesn't, no one really talks about this this much, but the amount of depression in entrepreneurship, I think there was a study that was done that was around 55% of entrepreneurs have some like major symptoms of depression. Yeah. I am one of them. Why? Because if all the employees are there hanging out, they can think about stuff on the weekend, about whatever they want for running a business. I'm like, if this doesn't work, no one gets paid. And you're constantly stressing about that a lot. And most people say, oh, here's my nice car after say 10 years of working. And if you don't have this, you're not doing the right thing, right? It's just so unrealistic. And plus, as you probably know, in the US, 90% of cars are actually leased or rented yeah. or like, yeah, this, they're not outright owned. They're not ownership. Bond. So yeah, imagine that amount of like, 
Yeah, yeah it's that, that whole... way in the UK though as well. It, it, you know, the, the, you know, we, we were a few years behind. You know, the states in adopting that model, but you know, uh, you know, we're getting more and more concentration into usership. You know, of vehicles yeah. and ownership, if that makes sense. But I get it. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool. So by the age of twenty-seven, Jeff. You've written two books, um, yes. Magic Workplace and The Key to the New You. By the yeah. way, you can get both of those on the Amazon. We will put the links below uh, in the show notes. So you can click through. Highly recommend that you, you, know, you jump on those. Um, and founded three companies, given TEDx talks, uh, managed to get zero speeding tickets, but countless parking tickets, <laughs> including a toy incident. So by 27, a lot of people, like you say, are either doing masters or follow-ons. I've not even done any of that. You've been in Silicon Valley. We've done this. We've yeah. been up. We've been down. Written two books. You know, well, tell us more about that motivation to write the books and the experience around the TED scene, what you gained. Well, I probably could have written four or five yeah. by now, but the problem is that my, a couple people who are like peers or mentors keep telling me, stop writing books and start making more money. So <laughs> I, I enjoy the whole process of it. One of the biggest problems that I have is that my following is not that strong compared yeah. to most. And I sometimes write because I think an idea is very, um, very strong. And it's not because like what glad, what is it? Malcolm Gladwell would do is he would have say a viral post on New York times. It goes well. And he realizes, okay, great. I should write a book around this. Yeah. So what started happening was I was writing books and it was just on ideas that I thought were good. And unfortunately they weren't necessarily what the audience wanted yeah. out there. So I, I have like three other books that I want to write that I'm holding off on it just because I'm like, okay, got to wait for it. Got to make sure the right, right topic, right time. So, I mean, those are the books things. I just enjoy doing it. Right. I'm a yeah. little introverted on that for the companies. Look, this is a bio. It's supposed to sound a lot more grandiose than it is. All the companies are profitable. They all earn money. These are not, hey, I raised $5 million and I have this team of engineers. It's not like that. It's more of, okay, I start a business here. It earns money. It's like a six-figure business. And now I'm starting a second one over here, yeah. right? It's a very unsexy thing. Yeah. I'm not like this new big data, artificial intelligence crap that you hear about. Look, I'm in computer science. Like I know when I see something, I'm like, that is such BS on there. Yeah. I'm not falling for that. And yeah. It's very, but you might say, well, where does that drive come from? Where does all that come from? And a lot of it's from growing up. Uh, it's during my early years, my, my parents used to like take me to the store, my mom. And what she would do is I love math. And so she would have me go through every single like can of beans that we're going to get Amazing. and calculate the price per ounce for each one. <laughs> and I would find the cheapest one for her. But the reason why is, she was too ashamed to do the math herself because of how frugal they had to live. Right. So I grew up, even though it was this nice glamour Silicon environment and like they had employees and everything, our home environment was very modest. Yeah. Like we probably took about three vacations. Yeah. And having someone who's like in the upper you know, class and three vacations. And by the way, we don't take weekends off, no. right? Work Sunday, Saturday. Those are usually in the yard because yeah. they also had rentals. They had other properties and stuff. So there's a lot of work on there. And I remember growing up just being really uncertain about money because the entrepreneurship path is very uncertain. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't want to have the same thing in my life. And that's why I'm, I'm very driven in that respect to make yeah. things happen in my life where I, I do have that sense of security. Yeah. Do you know what? It's a great way. And, you know, for the, for the way we build our businesses, Jeff, and, and, you know, and again, for the listeners and, and the people watching on the blog, um, whatever the revenue line is, we set our business or whatever the forecast is, we set our business to operate on 70%. So we're automatically going nice. to put money. You know, we strip the tax, you know, in the UK, we have VAT, your state tax and things like that. So that comes out. So I'm talking about net. So for every $1,000, um, you know, we're setting our business up as an absolute maximum. And I'm talking everything salaries i'm talking absolutely everything to 70 percent. so it's always leaving 30 percent headroom so if you've got 10 15 20 percent variance you, know, you have a bad month you miss a client you lose a client for whatever reason it should never impact on that cash so it keeps your cash you know reasonably positive and so that's if you do if you don't mind me asking then sure. so when you have that that 30 percent mm. in there that's so that's for the post tax you take the 30 percent out and make sure no it's not being touched and that's what goes into the business bank account 
So we, we, we split it. So uh, you heard of Mike Michalowicz uh, on the profit first sort of situation. And if you check out that book, and for anybody listening, Mike Michalowicz, I can't actually spell that off, off live on here. Yes, but if you check, if you search Mike Motorbike, uh, that's a bit easier to do. Uh, you'll pick up Mike Michalowicz's stuff and it's uh, profit first is, is the system. Um, and it's using some of the stuff we picked out in Richest Man in Babylon as well and what Jim Long mm-hmm. preaches mm-hmm. about a little bit. But ultimately, I suppose the best way to say it is the net income uh, after after any tax, uh, you know, we, we then set our business 30% lower. So, you know, even if we have a, 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 a horrible trading period, you know, you know, lose some clients, you know, uh, clients don't pay, they need a bit extra time, and ultimately our cash position stays there. And they're just decisions that you're making, and you may not be able to do that day one in your business. Uh, ultimately, if, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're funding and bootstrapping and, and it, you've got negative income, um, okay. then that's fine. But once you get past that, think about it, you know, a lot of people will maybe then say, hey, I'm going to have a salary increase, or hey, we're going to get that new car, or that new Porsche, right, right. whatever it would be. But then instead of saying, hey, well, the business is doing okay, it's got this revenue line, it's making this amount of money. If you were to take 30% off that net revenue line, and then just say, now what decision? Would I get the Porsche or would I get the BMW? Would I get the five bedroom condo or would I get the two bedroom apartment? So it allows right. you to stay humble and it allows you to keep there. So ultimately what you've also got as well, Jeff, and this is, you know, this is assuming that your business becomes profitable. I know yours are, but for the listeners, the business has become profitable. What it also allows you to do is build a war chest. So if you want to go on the acquisition trip, right. you want to do a major investment, you want to go and say, hey, I'm going to launch this new product. I need some R&D, you know, and, and I need to hire somebody to, you know, for three months to do that. You've got cash there. So it allows you to take a lot of opportunities. Um, and ultimately, if you're a lifestyle business, you know, for the listeners out there where you say, hey, I'm not too bothered about exiting and scaling and having multiple exits or whatever. And, uh, you know, you want to take your money now, you can do that and do whatever. But for me, I'd like to build a business, build that equity value, and then obviously either exit out of it or get a multiple on it. And to be fair, as you know, cash is king. And, you know, it just it's just a business model that I like. And it's not always doable. Um, but, you know, in the businesses that we do, we don't really have a lot of debt. You know, people pay in advance. We deliver services. So cash flows in, services gets delivered. So, you know, we are in the right model. So if you've got any questions on that as the listeners, you can always shoot us a message using the hashtag The Open Mic um, or connect with us on LinkedIn and we'll we'll get those type of questions answered for you. But that's just something that we jump push in there, Mm -hmm. Jeff. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if it's possible to do that, you know, in in all businesses out there, but it it gets the mind thinking to keep frugal and to live on the 70 and and just keep 30 there in case. And you can do whatever you want, pay it as dividends at the end of the year, reinvest it back in, you know, or just leave it there as a, you know, as a, as a war chest to, to, to build and do something at a later date. Yeah. I think it's for, it depends on the business, right? Cause Correct. if you have clients that give you recurring um, revenue, yeah. it's easier to calculate how much you should put aside because yeah. you, it's hard to say, well, post tax, I'm going to put aside from each individual <laughs> client. Yeah. Like, in my business, it's very volatile. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why I'm starting to, I'm building a second one right now on top <laughs> of the one that, that I have where so I do a lot of keynote speaking and what you do is you go out, you get paid like five, you get paid like 10 grand or something to go out and speak for an hour. But it's not like it's a reoccurring thing. Yeah. It's just boom, you're done. And then hopefully some people see you and say, Hey, can you speak here? And it kind of goes off from there. I would much rather have a client that pays me like say $2,000 over five months. Yeah. Recurring. That would be much nicer. Recurring business models are a lot more stable. And yes, you, yes. You know, for the FDs listening out there, the finance directors and the finance managers out there, not, you know, there's one thing that they hate about the sales line is, is the volatility of it. And recurring revenue or consistent revenue mm-hmm. is always a lot better, isn't it? So absolutely. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the bio there, Jeff. Um, sure. Fascination of psychology. I know today you focus your efforts on how to bridge the differences in the workplace of people, you know, working in an environment that they're excited about. Um, Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit more. You've worked with people like Google, Amazon, LinkedIn, a lot of others. But, you know, I know you always claim listing them all out gets a little bit boring pretty fast. But just tell us about what it's like working for some of those type of organizations and the type of, you know, the little bit of the work that you do, because we're going to get more into that later on. Yeah. So for instance, tomorrow I'm giving a talk at a retail uh, chain and they're in, they're basically targeting anywhere from 25 to 40 year old woman and they have clothes for them and they want to know how do we sell to different generations. And so what I do is I go in there and whether it's the management recruiting or selling, I show them how to overcome those gaps. Yeah. 
it's uh, and the media makes it a lot more complex than it needs to be. And the reason behind that is it's like in sales. If I can make you feel like you have a problem, you're more likely to purchase a product. Yep. And that's what the media tends to do. But when it comes down to generations, it's very simple where you can simply look at a expectation differences, right? When you grew up in the corporate world and I did, maybe you didn't have telecommuting. I do. So we're going to have sort of a disagreement there. Yep. And if you're running a team of different generations, you need to make sure that there will be that sort of variance, that gray area of different things, culture, work ethic, all those different things. It's making those more black and white. Yeah. But if you have that awareness, it's a lot easier to deal with. And it's like, okay, everyone has to be on the same page because if they're not, what happens is something is called Adam's equity theory and people have a sense of fairness. And if people don't feel like a workplace is fair, then they stop to, they start becoming resistant. Yeah. They start nine to five in it, engagement uh, drops. All those kinds of bad things happen. So being a manager or a leader in that organization, you need to make sure, hey, what's the variance? Make it black and white and put everyone on the same page so you can yeah. have more of a fair workplace. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And it, it's not as easy. And I, and I do hear you because, you know, I grew up, you know, late 70s, early 80s, and then, you mm. know, finished school mid 80s, no internet, you know, no smartphone. Uh, right. You know, as I started in in my career, and, I, and eventually I got into white collar because I was blue collar. I started as an mm. auto mechanic when I was school, but oh, awesome! Uh, yeah, and then when I got into white collar, um, you know, the internet was really, really, really early. You know, I mean, for you guys maybe not, uh, but here in the UK, there's not many companies, you know, with, outside of the major big players uh, having websites or anything like that. Email was just coming on on fashion '94, you know, '95, you know, and that sort of area, and then you know the the web site started to gather momentum in the late 90s and you know you know like my lad today you met him earlier our show uh, he, he, he was born with the internet in hand born with a smartphone in hand you know born with social networks being there um, I remember starting a digital agency inside our publicly traded company in, in 2005 um, and you know we joke about it in here and um, you know that's pre well I mean the Facebook was on campus but you know uh, Twitter wasn't involved LinkedIn wasn't around you know all these sort of you know social networks weren't even there when we started our first digital agency in 2005 um but you know we were you know i'm supposed to a modern push out you know i'm late 40s now mm -hmm. and i'm a modern push out but there's a lot of people in my generation who wasn't exposed to that digital arena and they're a country mile away from where i am now and thinking you know both owning and working in a digital agency as well as other things but you know people in the late 40s you know they're not that, so it must be, te not, not terrible, but it must be challenging to get those millennials coming in or whatever it would be with the sort of people in my generation who aren't tech savvy. Um, and I know you say about get it out there and put it on a black and white page, but you know, wow, do, is there a secret to sort of getting them on the same page, I suppose is what I'm saying, because I can imagine some of the arm wrestling challenges that I yeah. get. There's a couple of, I wouldn't say secrets because a lot of the things that people do to get others on the same page yeah there's standard management theory yeah let's say that you have an issue between uh, someone who's more senior yeah. who's a baby boomer and a younger employee and it's a matter of a new technology maybe the baby boomer is more re uh, resistant to it and the person who's younger is like hey it's a super simple why is there a problem yeah usually what you can do is something called reverse mentorship where the younger employee actually mentors the older one and the benefit to that is you actually have the older employee is able to teach the younger one simply by their presence, leadership and uh, management skills, Yeah. right? Prepare them for that. And that's something that Jack Welsh, the past CEO of General Electric really popularized. Yeah. It's so in the workplace, yes, black and white pages, but there's also a factor of leveraging everyone's knowledge. Yeah. It's like an organism, all the cells in an organism have to be prepared for certain pathogens entering. If only half know, then the organism will die, right? And so leveraging everyone's knowledge. So like, let's say uh, there's a new technology that's coming about. Let's say Twitch. Twitch is an online gaming platform. And I say that to executives and they're like, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, well, do you know that some of the world championships on there are more popular than the Super Bowl? They're like, no. And I'm like, well, you might want to be updated with that. And so it's leveraging that knowledge that say younger employees have and put it in the hands of more senior leaders because yeah. they know what to do with a good idea. 
They just might not be aware of all the ideas. Yeah, that's right. I love the reverse mentorship tip, uh, tip as well because sometimes they can feel that the nose has been pushed out, but that is a great strategy. Love that. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. It comes down to a lot of management where, so when I sit down with employees and I talk with them on one-on-ones, the areas where I get the best ideas for the company come from people in the front lines. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll say, hey, why don't we use this new CRM that does X, Y, and Z? Or why don't we try and optimize in this step of the uh, sales funnel? And I'm like, I didn't think about that because I'm not doing that job 40 hours a week, right? I might have, but that's, that's sort of the area where you, br- you start opening up those communication channels. Yeah. And that's where you can have companies that, sh- that thrive, but they have, people have to be necessarily open to that, yeah. which unfortunately is not as common as we would like. No, absolutely. Well, Jeff, thanks ever so much for sharing your, your, your backstory and your bio. Um, like, again, highs, lows, super interesting take on, you know, the, you know, the reality around all that as well. So really, you know, I'm really appreciative of you sharing that. I think the listeners get a great deal of value out of, uh, you know, understanding that upbringing, that journey. And, you know, obviously post and you've gone out there and, you know, made some mistakes as well, which is fantastic. Right. You know, I know you're going to be speaking out at inbounds at the HubSpot conference in um, in September, and uh, you know people see the speaker line up there, and they all think they're really super successful, and they've never had a bump in the road, and you know. But like I say, it, it, it's 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 really refreshing to hear the honesty. So thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Sure. So I really appreciate it. Um, so when we sort of talking about this building the remote sales systems, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, learning how to outsource your first rep. Um, how do people go about that? Pretty simple. First off is understanding what they actually want to outsource. Yep. Now there's this, this, a very easy one is a repeatable activity. For us, it was collecting emails. Yep. Now someone would say, great, that's really easy. Uh, you just go into LinkedIn and search people with this name. It's not that simple. Yeah. What you need to do is when you're performing a particular task that you want to outsource, you need to write down every single individual step that you're doing. What is it? How does it work? And then when you're ready to outsource and you hire that first person, you need to make sure that they leverage that sheet, that document sheet, but also make adjustments to it because very often what you'll have, and I do this as an exercise, a lot of people is I, I say, Hey, explain how to draw a picture and then, then explain it to them how to draw that picture without showing them the picture. You get something wildly different. So a lot of times when people document things, it's very, very often not well, because people have, uh, they don't know what they know in the sense. Yep. They have this like hidden knowledge. To be able to pivot in the real time at the coal face and be able to update that. Right. That, you know, this is actually what you wanted me to do, but I'm finding, you know, as I'm speaking with people or researching this specific task, there's either a better way or an easier way. And, and, and right. that's really what you do. So constant learning. Right. So that's, this right here is pretty basic. You'll hear this in a lot of books, but here's when to go into more of a new territory. When you have never outsourced anything before, Yep. You want to start with a project price, not an actual hourly rate. The yep. reason being is that you want to limit your liability of hiring people who are not a good fit. Yeah. So let's say you go onto a platform like Upwork or free, uh, I think there's something called, it used to be Elance, but just say Upwork because that's simpler. You go on there and you post, hey, I want someone to collect emails. It's 100 emails for $40. Yeah. And I'll be giving you a document sheet And once those are complete, I'll release the funds. In that case then, when you hire someone and they don't do the job, they don't get the money. Yeah. But if it's someone who's hourly, they'll be constantly billing you and then you'll get mad, they'll get mad that you're like not giving the right instructions and then there's a certain tension. When I hire people, a lot of them in the beginning don't work. And that's what people have a really hard time with. And it's if you ever, I grew the company from just myself up to now like 10 people, right? And there were some high churn, but as we got more people involved, we started having solely internal hires Yeah, because they were telling their friends. Now, the thing is, is once you get that one task that's repeatable, right? I usually do is hire three people for the same task yep. that you can break it up in. And then usually one would work out and then you hire, then you give them another task, another one. These are usually the same thing. For us, it was collecting emails. Uh, I had a friend who was using it to create advertisements for particular events, go on Eventbrite, create the event, do some posts on social media. And it was a list of like five, 10 things that they said for $40. Yeah. Then once that person is able to do it consistently, right? 
And so let's say you go through four or five different milestones of $40. Yep. You say, hey, we would like to move you from a part-time basis and it would be these series of activities per week. Is yep. this something you can do? Yes, great. And that's when you have a project management uh, like Trello or something to yep. kind of match their activities so that they're going through there. Then what gets interesting is as soon as they're able to handle that level and you're talking, you have probably a one-on-one with them every two weeks to see yep. how things are going, they might say, I want to grow, grow in the company. Okay, then what you can do is have them move up, but then hire someone else in their place. They get to train that person. Perfect. So now when you have two people, you're not building the culture. Yep. And this is where it gets really fun is then you can start having one person becomes a manager, these person come in, but it takes a little while for to get those first two to really yeah. sink in. But it's a great tip about the project price. You'd like to say you, you're limiting your exposure and uh, you know, either under delivery or you're just not writing checks all the time. That's, that's the problem with a lot of people. They try to do that with tech or like with hiring a software engineer to hiring people in sales. But very often you, no matter how good someone is in a face-to-face -face interview, no matter how good their resume is, you don't know if they're going to be working well because they could have three other clients you don't know. Yeah. And, or maybe something happens in their family, but you want to limit your liability on there. Yeah. And that's a really easy way of doing it. Perfect. That's great. And I really appreciate you spelling that out, Jeff. That, that, that's great. So you mentioned earlier about the processes and we call them SOPs or, you know, standard operating procedures or, you know, whatever that would be. What's the best way, you know, is there, a, would you use software? I know you talked about Trello earlier and things like that, but is there a better way to create the SOPs and the documentation? So, you know, when you're building that up and training people, mm -hmm. is, there, is, is there a wider opportunity to think about that? For SOPs, mm -hmm. I'm very old school. I like to keep it less technology if I can. I, yeah. What I literally did was I wrote down every single activity that I had to do every week yeah. and then slowly but surely outsource each individual one and assign it to people. Got it. And that's how the actual, like going from say one person to 10 people worked. Yeah, it's good. But if someone man. actually, yeah, walking through it, it's really simple, but then you can have also links to the documentation pages from there. Yeah. Interesting. And moving that forward into the payment structure, you mentioned about project pricing, yes. uh, you know, creating the appropriate payment structure. How do you know how to get started with that straight away? What, what, what's your tip around that? Yeah. Great question. I had a lot of, spend a lot of time thinking about this because when you hire people from different countries, the pay rate is different. I was talking to someone who does sales management for a living because I was having an issue with some of the performance on people on the sales side is they were getting tons of appointments, but they weren't quality appointments. And I was trying to ask, well, what should we incentivize them on in terms of the pipeline? Because if you get say, if it's solely closed business, but they're not the account executive that they're closing, then chances are that when they're sending out a whole bunch of emails, they're going to feel, you know, bad if it doesn't close because it's not in their control. Yeah. So what he basically told me was this, is that you want to look at average salary, right? And, Traditionally, you can have the incentivization structure be like a 50-50, 50 the base, 50 the performance. Sometimes people do 25-75. Yeah. I prefer more of the 40-60. 40% is the base, 60% is, if they hit 100% of their quota, that is um, above average salary, right? Yeah. Not a massive, but it's above average for the hours that they put in. Yeah. So once you have that number, then what you do is you say, okay, what sort of activities do I want to incentivize? Yeah. And from those activities, what you tend to do then is say, okay, they need to get say 10 appointments a week or five appointments a week. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and how much business do we need to sort of quote in that period of time? Like when you're trying to find new people uh, for investing, how much money do they have? And then eventually how many of those close? So you have to have that previous data in order to map out how much it should be of the business pending and also the closed. Here's where it gets sort of interesting is that when you have reoccurring uh, revenue or when you have extra like cross sales, right? That gets a little bit more complex on there. But what I would do is I would take the salary, map out the actions where they have to basically have their position be a, at least a 10 X ROI for them, or maybe like seven to 10 X. And then from there, you'll be able to take that commission side and then break it up into how many activities are needed. Trusting. So let's say if there's three closed, uh, business deals that will meet their monthly salary, then you say, okay, so then it's say uh, they need a hundred dollars for their commission or thousand dollars for their commission. 
each one of those closed ones would be $333. Yeah, and you break it down from that point. Right. So there's a lot of different ways to uh, create uh, commission structures, but I think the easiest one for people to understand is just activity to yeah. um, business, acti- uh, business activity to like commission price. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I love the idea about the, you know, getting the base and the performance related slightly higher than average because it motivates people to do well. And I remember when we raised VC uh, and venture capital money, um, yeah. our basic salary as an exec team were below market average. And I was happy to take a below market average base salary because the performance was, you know, right, you know right. 30% more. So if we hit target and did what we said we were going to do, then ultimately we'd earn 30% more than what we would have done if we'd have done it the other way. And the VCs loved it because it was lower risk for them on cash and executive pay burn. And we were all motivated to, you know, hit the numbers, which it, it worked really, really well. So slightly different example because that's not, not right. BC, but I understand the, the weight in it to the performance and motivating people to earn more than what they could do if they do what you expect them to do. Right. But the problem is that this only works as a, if you have some sort of past data yep. of what the conversion rates are. And on top of that, you know, if they perform consistently because the toughest part is if you hire like an SDR sales development rep yep. and they ghost or they just, do a really poor job and now you're paying this huge base. What yeah. we tend to do is we move them up in the company where they're doing a simple task and it grows to the point where, you know, we've been working with them for at least four months before we move them up yeah. to an SDR. Yeah. Not all places have that luxury, but usually companies have like a junior sales rep yeah. and they're doing more prospecting than one's actually the one that sets the appointment and the other one does the close. So there's absolutely. similar models in the actual corporate structures. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, for you guys, look at your own businesses, take a view of it. And then, you know, you can, you can break it down look at the data. And sometimes you work with the data that you've got and, you know, you might get your team engaged because if they've come from previous positions, you know, I'm not saying just believe what they say, but get them involved as well. And they may have some data and they may be confident to say, yeah, we can make X number of calls or X number of appointments or whatever it would be. But, you know, data doesn't lie to F, does it, at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, you may have to just go through a period of figuring it out to start with to get that data. So, and that's okay as well. You know, it's better to do that than just overcommit yourself. And in those situations, I don't know what you, your view on this is, Jeff, but if I don't have the data and I am literally flying a little bit blind, I will ask the, you know, the employee or the contractor to share, not some of the risk with us, but I'll say, hey, look, I can't commit to this for six months, but, you know, for the next six weeks or whatever it may be, this is what we're going to do. And then each week we're going to reveal the data. And based on what comes out, we may have to increase or decrease the percentages. Are you fine with that? And just about being honest with people. And, and I don't know if you've come across a situation like that. Yeah. No, I recently started doing that with account executive where she usually closes all of our deals. And I yeah. said, hey, what if she wanted to get uh, an increase in her salary? And I said, well, what if you try and call in a high quality list, like list of people? Yeah. And we don't know the data. So then I said, what do you feel will be something will motivate you? And weirdly enough, she said, if I get 5% of all the business or like 10% of all the business, right? And I said, okay, you know what? Limits my liability and motivates her. Let's do it. Let's go with it. Brilliant. Love it. So one of the things is remote culture. And I know you've talked, you talk about that. How do you build that remote culture to make employees stay? Because, you know, they're not all cuddled in, they're not all high five and looking at the vision or the mission on the wall. Um, right. How, how do you approach that? You know, I know you touched on it earlier about, um, you know, building hiring, yeah. up and hiring and things like that. And then you've got the, you know, all those sort of comments around that. But is, 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 is that it? Or would you say there's, there's another skill to sort of build in that culture? Because I know, especially in our age, See, you know, we've got a lot of internal people, but we do hire external and getting that fit, getting them to be the mm-hmm. same culture can, can be challenging. And, you know, there's a saying out there, isn't it? You've sometimes got to kiss a lot of frogs before you meet a, meet a prince. Um, and, 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 you know, but that can be expensive. It can be poor quality work. It could be whatever it would be. So, you know, remote culture. Talk to us a little bit more about that, Jeff, if you could. Yeah. Going back to that thing you just said about the kissing the frogs. Whenever someone says you need to find amazing people, it just tells me that they don't have good enough systems. Yeah. Interesting. They think that someone can magically do it all for them. So if you're in that position where you're like, oh, if I just had amazing people, you need to look at what kind of systems you have. If you want to know of a company that did that, did that effectively, look at Toyota. Yeah. Right. Okay. The Toyota Way is a great book in terms of their management. It's just it's systems all the way. And there's a lot of research that shows that. So yeah. in terms of the actual culture, there's a few things you need to do differently than the in-person cultures. The remote cultures, the tendency is that people get off track a lot of the time. 
with yeah. my team and what I've seen, I've looked at lots of companies across the board is a daily check-in that the team meets up 15 minutes. They say what they did last time we met, what they're going to do, any sort of blocks. Yeah. What the weird part is you think, oh, that's a micromanagement thing. It's not actually because what happens is people feel more engaged with what they have to do and they start chatting with each other, right? Before the meeting, after the meeting, they start saying all so a bunch of silly things. And they actually, what my team does is get on the call like 15 minutes early and they start talking with each other. So it's pretty right. cool. So that's the first thing, having those weekly uh, meetings because the face-to-face -face contact is super important. Yeah. Uh, what I like to do is have monthly one-on-ones with everyone in the company. It's small enough at that point, but instead of it being about performance-based, it's just, hey, how are you doing? And you yeah. build that personal connection with them. And what you'd be really surprised, and a lot of the people in my company, it's very high retention, and they say it off and on. It's like, look, well, we're in, say, a third world country or we're not in like one of those big countries. People don't really respect us at all. Yeah. And they don't say don't that take, like outright taking time to be one on one with them. Yeah. You, people don't, yeah. People don't treat them as a human being. Yeah. And if you actually do that with someone who might not be in the same financial situation that you are in, man, does that go a long way? Big yeah. time. Yeah. So actually breaking that time for one on ones. The other thing that we're doing too, is that I'm actually flying out to, uh, we're having an annual get together. And as soon as I said that everyone's, engagement shot the roof and some people would think it's weird because i actually part of the team is based in the philippines yeah and someone would say well why why are you gonna fly to the philippines that's like three grand and you can put everyone in the hotel and all total that's gonna be like you know shy of 10 grand and i said look the amount of which that motivates the team and makes them realize that i care about each and every one of them the amount of productivity business closed all that that will relate the next year easily outweighs the price yeah. It does. And you'll get that extra yard for them. And, you know, I love that. So, you know, whether you are working in third world countries, whether you're working in Eastern European, in the States, whatever it would be, yep. it doesn't have matter. That screen, you know, the screen, like we're doing a virtual meeting, you're in Boston, we're in Leeds in the right. UK here. You know, it's, it's still a one-on-one, -on -one. You, you know, you get mannerisms, you get, you know, you joke, you laugh, yep. you have all the emotion about it. And for that person, like you say, hey, the boss spent, you know, 10 minutes with me, half an hour with me, whatever that is today, you know, they go and tell the family, they look forward to getting paid and that they're going yeah. and do more extra, and do better quality work, isn't it? Well, yeah, because even so, like I've had people on the team refer their siblings. Amazing. And nice. like, and by the way, they all worked in corporate. Like some of them worked at, Hey, I worked at at and I worked at Chase. These are not like dumb dumbs, you know, they're very smart. They're very capable individuals. And just having that ability and having that referral aspect, well, the culture thing, right? Going back to that, when you start building that internal, like couple employees, whenever a new position opens up, you say, Hey, uh, a new position's opening up. Here's a referral bonus. If you know anyone, please refer them. When they refer yeah. someone, chances are they're a past coworker that they like. Yeah. And then they come into the company. They're excited because they know people, similar culture, and they start adding people. Yeah. In there. And right and that's, now. That's part of the career progression opportunities, isn't it? Which, which, you know, like you say, if they're referring the buddy into the system, they don't want to be bringing anybody in who is going to be, you know, a deadbeat or even a rotten apple culture. You know, they only want to be bringing people in who was going to be, you know, elevating and, and at their level, I'm assuming. Right. Right. And it has a lot more accountability too, because they have a relationship outside the workplace. And it's weird because even my manager, what she would do is, so she would fly out to different places in the Philippines yeah. just to meet them. And I'm like, I didn't even tell you to do that. She's like, I know. I just want to hang out with them. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Awesome. But that's part of it, right? Is that they start work. They start doing things for you because if they understand the mission, they, as if you're leading the company and they agree with who you are as a person and you take the time, yeah. they'll go up and beyond for you. Yeah, that's it. And I suppose that's all about setting up the structure to create those progression opportunities. Um, is there anything we've missed on that, Jeff, or is there anything you'd like to add around that career progression opportunity sort of point? Uh, I can mean, I can go on for hours about this. <laughs> so. We're running short of time as we rack yeah. out there. But if you've got any further questions on that, check out uh, Jeff online. I am Jeff Butler. Um, you can get him at jeffjbutler.com as well. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure you'll be happy to answer some questions there as well for the, for the listeners. Mm -hmm.
Definitely. That's absolutely amazing. I really appreciate you sharing you, your expertise, expertise today, Jeff. We didn't get too much on the millennials. We talked about cross-generation and things like that. We'll have yeah. to get back for another podcast on, on millennials for sure. Um, but thanks for adding so much value. And I can't wait to see you speak at Inbound as well at the HubSpot uh, annual conference in uh, September. Um, so, Jeff, if we're looking at this building, this remote sales systems, you talked about, you know, getting the system right. And then, you know, a little bit like McDonald's, build the system, and then employ people to run it type of thing uh, it, it's a little bit of that sort of example but if you were to summarize all this up into sort of three sort of pro tips for somebody looking to get started with that how, how would you break that down for them focusing on performance based in the beginning yeah make sure you document all the process of you doing the activities you have to do everything yep. in the business at yep. some point and three when you're building the culture focus on internal referrals because yep. that's where you're going to get the highest level of retention yeah, that's really, really important, isn't it? These thread. So think about it being performance based. Document the process. Do the work yourself. Don't just expect somebody to do that. You know, you know, iron it out, iron the creases out, and then go out and put that out there. And then you know, focus on the internal referrals. Jeff, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure. Um, I've learned so much from you today. My show books uh, notes are full. Uh, I'll be busy writing up after that. It, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks ever so much indeed for joining us today. It, it, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. No problem, Mike. No, happy to be on. <laughs> pleasure. So as always, you know, as I say, you, we appreciate you continuing your growth engine development, listening and taking time out. We'll put all the show links and the website address and uh, all Jeff's social media posts in the, in the show notes below and on the app and as always to get in the game go do the hustle go make it happen and we're going to catch up with you on another open mic podcast real soon you have been listening to the open mic brought to you by the success hub to find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode Simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section. Thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to The Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.